Welcome to the Executive Innovation Show podcast, where we bring you real executive conversations with industry game changers and thought leaders. We ask the questions you're thinking, what you're scared to ask, and we make your brain hurt afterward. With your host, Carrie Chitsy Wells, co founder and CEO of One Touch Video Chat, live video interviews, and the nonprofit Humans Helping Humans. Hello, everybody, and welcome to today's podcast of the Executive Innovation Show brought to you by One Touch Telehealth. We've got a great show and two great guests for you today. We're going to be talking about chronic disease management and palliative care, virtual care versus hospice care. We've got two great guests with us today. We have Dr. Timothy Erig, who's the Chief Medical Officer at Crossroads Hospice and Palliative Care, and also the founder and CEO of Erig. MD and Associates. He cares for the sickest and most vulnerable people around the world. His unparalleled success in transforming the culture of medicine through patient-centered care, increasing the quality of life and the length of life. Then later in the show, we're going to be talking to Dr. Kim Kebler, who's the founder and director of Multiple Chronic Conditions Resource Center, highlighted by the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services for providing resources to improve patient care for the largest and fastest growing U.S. population. She's award-winning author of eight textbooks, multiple peer review publications, and chronic care and palliative care. So, (laughs) how are you, Tim? Welcome to the show. Hi, thank you. I'm well. Thanks for the opportunity. Great. Well, we're going to be talking today about a uh, um, near and dear subject and a touchy subject. Um, you and Dr. Kibler are both on kind of the front lines of chronic care and palliative care. And historically, we think of palliative care as hospice. Um, we think of it as death. And we're going to talk about a few different topics today, really around chronic care management and palliative care, um, extending that chronic disease management into home. Um, should we be talking about, <clears throat> excuse me, palliative care and hospice as two different things for better patient outcomes, caregiver experience, and um, incentives from a payer perspective? And, you know, where should these hard conversations be happening as we're kind of prolonging life? People are wanting to age at home. Um, you know, caregivers aren't what they used to be on, you know, being able to provide for loved ones people aren't wanting to go into facilities and where does the future of that really come? So I want to start, you're kind of in the trenches having these conversations every single day and we've got longer lifespans. We're kind of prolonging a lot of these chronic care diseases and conditions, which is ultimately creating less quality of life and, and kind of longer in that. So, my real first question to you is, should we be thinking about end of life, palliative care, hospice as separate, as the same? Uh, what are your thoughts? Are they different? And if so, why? Great question. Huge question. So we'll take the next 10 hours to <laughs> yeah. explore that. Um, you know, they're different um, in, in a fundamental respect because the reimbursement model for each. I, I tend to look at it and uh, our institution looks at, hey, I'm going to care for an individual the same if they're three years from dying or three minutes from dying. You know, the care does not change. Right. So effectively, what's in a name? I, I want to bring an honest narrative. And if you call it palliative, okay. If you call it hospice, okay. I call it just good quality, honest care that leads with true informed consent. Find out what's sacred to the individual. And deliver on that every day. Deliver on what we can and, and, and should be doing for someone. Not just, you know, what this, uh, the world of medicine says, you have a disease and then we're just going to run the gamut on that disease. Uh, that negates the human being. And we need to focus on identifying when people are coming into this, you know, period of their life. Uh, and being very honest and, and forthright and saying, this is the truth. What is sacred to you? And let's take it one day, one hour, one minute at a time. So palliative hospice, I I respect uh, the nomenclature. uh, But what we really need to be focused on is really highest quality uh, end of life care. 
And do you think that because with hospice, you're, you know, you're giving up the rights, you know, to go into the hospital, do you think that's a lot of kind of the controversy on wit, you know, are patients or caregivers waiting kind of too late to make that decision because of that? Or do you think that's not a contributing factor? Well, what I'm going to offer is probably pretty controversial. I think the healthcare system as a whole precludes choice. Right. And so patients aren't aware right, of inevitability. You know, first of all, we're all going to die. I don't want to die any sooner as my time. Um, but it's a fact. And the healthcare system will only offer you that choice, if they offer it at all, after they've done all the stuff they can do to you. They've chewed you up and they spit you out. And, you know, you commented earlier, what is the, uh, the economics of this? Right? You know, 5% of the population, 50% of the healthcare spend, $2 trillion. Um, and we know that all of that doesn't potentiate increased quality of life or length of life. We're actually hurting people and, and bringing them to the death sooner. So it's not that they, uh, they choose at that point. More often than not, they're not even given a choice. They're not even given a true understanding of what they're dealing with. And so, you know, the, the healthcare industry is stealing from them uh, the opportunity to choose how they want to live their lives. Right. And that kind of brings up my, my next um, thought in a personal hit home here of, you know, a lot of your specialty docs that are diagnosing, you know, whether it's in stage renal disease, it's cancer, it's oncology, cardio, you know, whatever it may be. Um, I feel like there's not a lot of those honest conversations going on where we give a patient, you know, options to prolong life, but the quality of life is so bad that, you know, there's not an honest conversation to say, hey, you know, you could live for, you know, 12 months or you could go down path B and, you know, you could live for three years, but, you know, you're going to barely get out of bed and you're going to, you know, those conversations yeah. aren't had. I feel like there's a lot of, you know, giving of hope of, you know, hey, you can do X or you can do Y, Z, y, Z that uh, there's not those real conversations, especially in specialty medicine of, you know, here is an option, um, you know, what is important to you, quality of life? Um, how, and I know you feel strongly about, you know, how do you want to live your remaining days, right? Um, Absolutely. Do, yeah, so do you feel like, you know, those specialty docs should be more honest with patients and caregivers? So another big question, I think it's not just limited to specialty docs. Right. I think there needs to be more transparency. I, I would offer a, a majority of providers don't see the truth, right? And so they don't accept that death is going to happen. They can't talk about it, certainly can't think uh, about creative or alternative, you know, means of caring for an individual other than, you know, what the next therapeutic clinical intervention is. So, you know, they don't even recognize that it exists. They're trained, you know, I was trained to see disease and debility and, and to do something to it. If either of those increases, I do more to it. Um, so there's, there's a blindness that exists about the absolute physiologic inevitability. But also to your point, um, you know, if we are insightful enough to realize that death actually, uh, you know, can't be escaped, um, yeah, we, we don't tell the truth. The system doesn't say this is what's going to happen um, and then ask you what's important to you. True informed consent, patient decision making is really, you know, do you want to start chemotherapy on Tuesday or Thursday? Right. Well, if you've got a widely metastatic pancreatic cancer and your functional level is, is really, really low, you're bed bound, you're not eating, right? Your median life expectancy is six to eight months, no matter what we do. So instead of saying, let's, start chemotherapy? Would you like a Whipple procedure and this and that? I mean, you know, we're stealing from people the opportunity to know the truth. And it's almost fraudulent. It's fraudulent to offer those things, which we know we're not going to change the outcome. And we know we're not going to turn the corner. And to those colleagues say, I don't want to steal hope, right, for my patients. Well, hope has to be defined. What do we hope for? Yeah. Hope for a cure? I don't want them to stop fighting. Neither do I. 
<laughs> yeah. My patients, they fight, they fight every day through their last breath. We have to be very clear what we're fighting for. And, and if I may just for a second, we need to shift the narrative, right? I don't want to lose hope. I want to keep fighting. Um, you know, we're so afraid of death. Check the box. We're all going to die, right? Let's talk about how do you want to live and love and live, uh, learn and grow. Yeah. When we shift it a little bit, we know that this, you know, you could live three years longer. You don't live three years longer, right? When you, when you focus on living, loving, learning, and growing with the truth, people live better and longer than really through any clinical interventions we can, we can provide to, to that patient population. So that, that misnomer of you live longer and this and that, it's um, to a great extent, it's a fallacy. And again, it just exemplifies we're stealing from people the opportunity to live, just fighting, trying to die, and that leads to paralysis. Yeah, I feel the same. Don't get me started on the end-stage renal failure. You know, I think that, you know, dialysis in, in general is just brutal on your body. And I think, you know, when you look at more patients that are, you know, because we're not doing enough kidney disease kind of education as a whole. I mean, I know with the Trump changes within the home dialysis by 2026, I think that's going to have a big impact on palliative care and, and hospice in general. Um, I mean, hopefully home dialysis will help patient outcomes, but, um, you know, starting dialysis at stage five, um, I think there's, you know, you can kind of, uh, you know, stay on dialysis and, you know, live for some period of time. But to your point is looking at a patient's full picture, you know, I hear stories every single day of, you know, dialysis versus palliative care. And if you have, you know, significantly more, you know, other chronic things going on, I mean, once you go on dialysis, I mean, there's, you know, it's kind of like, uh, you know, on the oncology side, I mean, at least you could stop chemo uh, dialysis, you know, there's no turning back. Um, so I don't feel like there's a lot of, on the nephrology side, you know, options on quality of life. Um, from that side, have you seen any shifts in that over uh, the last few years, or where do you think that's headed? I haven't, you know, not specific to, to nephrology. I mean, I'm, I'm think as you're sharing that, I'm, I'm grieving and, and I'm just cringing because I, I remember a nephrologist who used to say, you know, nephrology, starting dialysis is just like taking a multivitamin. <laughs> and so the entryway into the conversation is fraudulent and you set up expectations that can't be met and to the orthopedist who says well you know she's got dementia she's bed bound hasn't talked in three weeks and isn't in pain but she broke her hip because you know we dropped her in a transfer at the nursing home we have to do surgery because the hip is broken you know to me these are egregious atrocities if you don't share that uh, you know the end stage renal failure patient, uh, dialysis is much more than taking a multivitamin. Yeah. And, you know, it, I, you can tell I'm kind of flustered. I just get baffled that uh, if somebody has that fixed false belief, right, which is defined uh, as a delusion, uh, they shouldn't be practicing medicine because they're certainly not caring for people. They're just doing a lot of egregious stuff to people. Now, Nephrology does a lot of good stuff, right? Yeah. Dialysis works wonders for a lot of people. We're talking a real, you know, segment of the population uh, that's respective of this, of this conversation. Um, so I, I, I agree with you, tell how passionate I'm getting, <laughs> that something needs to change. They don't recognize inevitability. Uh, they're not held accountable. Right. They're not held accountable for telling the truth and in the end what it does more often than not, it actually diminishes quality of life. Big time. It actually shortens length of life. And when the end of life comes, patients feel betrayed. They feel as though uh, the person who they were supposed to believe in, this altruistic long white coat, uh, has stolen from them the opportunity to express who they are and live how they want to, regardless of whatever disease they're dealing with. And that, you know, that's... Um, that's just wrong. 
Yeah, and I think a lot there's generalizations that are used, right? Um, and I know we're personally going on a dialysis tangent here, so I apologize. But, um, you know, it's one thing if, you know, whether it's, you know, breast cancer, whether it's oncology, whether it's dialysis, if you have a healthy patient that's 35 and has two young kids and that is the only thing going on with them, dialysis is a great option for that person, right? Absolutely. They've got nothing else going on. Maybe they're waiting on a kidney transplant, whatever. We have a 75 year old patient that has, you know, five or six other, you know, other chronic diseases or comorbidity to, you know, give the same generalization of you can be on dialysis for, you know, 20 years. That is a total miss, you know? Yeah. For somebody yeah. that's 30, that could be 20 years. Um, and even, I think that's a stretch, but um, I think in general, you know, a lot of to your, to your uh, point earlier, you know, uh, a lot of folks in medicine think that, you know, they can kind of help any, you know, patient or kind of treat it as one stroke, breast stroke across all page demographics. And I think that's why a lot of doctors get into, you know, the DOs and the full body and things like that is really, you know, understanding which palliative care does a great job in really understanding that patient, I think, um, and spending more time. Is that because of the ratios or, because I, I mean, my experience with palliative care is they really are significantly more honest and really get to know the patient a little bit deeper than, you know, primary care, internal medicine, or specialty uh, from that perspective. So good question. And I think, you know, a generalization is you know, the specialty of palliative care is to look at things a little differently. Right. So maybe the lens through which we look at a patient and, and all of these clinical complexities um, gives us the ability to engage at a different level. Um, you know, the best way we can help, whether you're palliative or anybody, is uh, to see the truth, right? really accept the truth, and yep. then to be a translator of that truth. Because at the end of the day, right, it's not my life. It's your life. And for me to make some assumptions or uh, withhold information, you know, relevant information, then um, I, I, you know, I've said it before, I'm stealing from you. Yep. And uh, that's, we have a fiduciary, ethical, and moral responsibility uh, to care. And just because we can do something doesn't mean we should. We have to ask, what are your goals? Once you understand this truth of what's going on, what is sacred to you? And, you know, someone chooses to not do, you know, dialysis or chemotherapy or whatever. They're not giving up. If they know the truth and it's consistent with who they are and how they want to live, that's a very active decision. Uh, we get uncomfortable with that as physicians. Because um, if somebody dies, we've failed is our, right. you know, way we're trained. But again, everybody's going to die. We should stop focusing so much on that endpoint and shift it and say, how do you want to live? Right. Right. No, that makes a lot of sense. And so my last question is, you know, while our audience is a lot of healthcare executives, everybody's kind of the, of the age that, um, you know, I probably hear it, you know, multiple times a day that, you know, a lot of the <clears throat> Gen Z's and, uh, so forth, or sorry, Gen X's are now caregivers to their parents. What advice do you have to caregivers to ask the right questions and have those hard conversations? Because I know that's one of the key things we get a lot is, you know, how do you, uh, you know, to your point, you know, dealing with death in general and hospice and palliative care is a tough thing but you have a lot of caregivers now making decisions for their parents that are asking, you know, physicians more and more questions and getting involved. So if you had to give advice to caregivers on, you know, helping their family or friends, you know, kind of ask the right questions to determine that quality of a life before treatment or, and, you know, going to palliative care, what advice would you have for the audience that, are, that is caregivers? Another great question. And having been one, and that's one cap that I think gives me the most credibility is, is walking the journey with my mom a few yep. years ago. 
um, it is to demand the truth, to listen to your little voice right, that we all have. Uh, it is absolutely always correct. And if what you're hearing and what you're feeling is not consistent with what they're, uh, you know, what's happening, press the physicians, right? I, I hate to put it in this context, but you're the customer, yeah. period. And yeah. it's your life. You know, we serve at the, at the, at the pleasure of, of caring for you. If it doesn't feel right, question. You deserve and you have the right uh, for a palliative care referral, to talk to hospice physicians, to, to yeah. whatever it is, it's your life. And if I can, just briefly to those healthcare executives, right, the advice I would give is you got to move away from healthcare reform, right? Process mapping the same type of care we've delivered over the last century uh, isn't going to change outcomes, isn't going to change this. And, and right. many executives are only focused on the, on the bottom line, the financial uh, aspects. When you have the aggregate ACO, median per capita reduction in expenditures, you know, one and a quarter percent. Um, that's nothing. That's healthcare reform. We need to reform how we care. Yep. And that starts with honest conversations, empowering people to ask questions, shifting the narrative from being afraid of dying to let's embracing how we live our life regardless of what we're dealing with. Yeah. <clears throat> no, those are all great points. So before I let you go, when we bring on Dr. Kibler, um, we always ask everybody, what is one thing healthcare related that's keeping you up at night outside of family, caregiving, kids, all that kind of fun stuff? Another great question. It is that we have these institutions of medicine. We have the, the macro world, um, kind of these large healthcare systems that uh, really believe that they have the answer to, um, uh, to caring, which means, you know, shifting their financial narrative. Um, it, it has to be thinking about inevitabilities. We're all going to die and, and, and working backwards. Um, we have to tell the truth and we have to hold each other accountable. Um, until we do that, until we acknowledge the absolute physiologic reality, we can't accept it. When we do that, we can't create a real vernacular to talk about it, and we can't do that. Uh, it precludes us from, from thinking of nonlinear ways of, of caring for people, right? Breaking free from this formulaic, doing things to you, right? So we've got to move beyond that. That's what keeps me up at night. Well, awesome. It has been so great to have you on the show. You have provided some really great insight and we really appreciate it. So I want to say goodbye and thank you before we bring on Dr. Kibler. Thanks so much for being on the show. Thank you. Dr. Kibler, welcome to the show. Thank you. Well, great. We were talking with Dr. Tim earlier about all things kind of uh, chronic disease management and palliative care. Um, you've had the kind of pleasure of being both on the chronic side as well as working extensively in the pain management side. Do you think that, what's your opinion on pain management as it relates to palliative care, chronic disease management? A lot of times we don't, even though pain is a chronic condition, we don't really classify it as that, sometimes both from the clinician side as well as the physician side. Do you think we should be talking about pain in relation more to chronic care? And do you think it intersects with palliative care? Absolutely. I think that palliative care is basically symptom management. And if we look at patients that have multiple chronic conditions or those that have two or more conditions at the same time, which is three out of four Medicare uh, uh, beneficiaries, yeah. they have concomitant arthritis. They have concomitant low back pain. I just wrote a paper on low back pain and, and the uh, statistics are that 80% of uh, adults will have low back pain at some point in their life. Right. So we know that if pain isn't appropriately managed, that will continue for a long period of time and eventually becomes chronic and is part and partial with uh, other chronic conditions. So yeah, it fits in and palliative care is symptom management. So palliative care is managing the pain 
that is affected by these underlying conditions. So a lot of times palliative care and hospice are kind of used interchangeably. And when people think, oh, I should talk to, you know, a palliative care, uh, you know, physician, they think of dying, right? Um, and Dr. Tim talked a little bit earlier of, you know, uh, it's about quality of life, not quantity of life. And, you know, you should have those conversations when you're ready to have those conversations. As we looked at, it, at that in conjunction with pain, what types of patients should, you know, have those conversations with palliative care, um, you know, as we have, you know, increase in opioids and, you know, depending upon states, you know, and, and things like that, or people are having um, different types of surgeries to kind of prolong or help alleviate 30% of back pain or whatever it may be. When's that intersect that those conversations should, uh, you know, happen? Well, that's a big question. I know, um, I know. I like big questions, so you can break it all, down if it's I, easier. Um, palliative care is very different than hospice care, and I've been in the field for almost three decades now, and all of my work is to separate palliative care from hospice care because palliative care should actually be integrated into chronic disease management the minute somebody's diagnosed with a chronic condition, heart failure, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, kidney disease, um, chronic arthritis or low back pain or failed back surgeries, all of those give an opportunity for palliative care to increase the symptoms or increase the management of symptoms rather. Right. And palliative care is evidence-based. And if we look at the origin of where both palliative care and hospice came from, they came from very different places. Palliative care came from McGill University, a very strong research-based uh, practice by physicians and hospice came from social work uh, origin in, um, in England. So palliative care actually increases in its intensity as the patient begins to decline and become debilitated. So everything that I promote and, and write about is that palliative care actually helps to maintain physical functioning. If we can maintain physical functioning, that is the number one indicator of quality of life. And if patients are uh, physically active, and become less debilitated, they're gonna have a better quality of life. But if they're symptomatic, they're gonna end up in the hospital, they're gonna become more debilitated, they're gonna have increased uh, pain and all, and reductions in physical functioning, and it becomes a downward spiral. So I look at palliative care as almost preventative medicine. It prevents patients from going into hospital if you're, if you're proactive in managing those symptoms that prevent them from carrying out their activities of daily living. And how, and as we look at, I, mean, I think that's a great explanation and that echoes a lot of, you know, what Dr. Tim was talking about earlier. And as we look at um, pain, because it is such a big issue um, in America right now, it's such a big issue in older generations and blue collar and, and it hits every kind of class, right? Um, we talk a lot about prescription opioids on the show, and, and we won't go too far down that rabbit hole, but as we look at pain as a whole, you know, you've got the spinal stimulators, you've got, you know, all the new epidural nerve blockings, you've got all these things that pain docs are trying to get folks off the opioids, and, you know, depending on who you talk to, you know, there's probably two sides, two opinions by a uh, provider to every coin here, um, on prolonging kind of pain, when does it make sense? I mean, is for somebody that's actively in pain management to talk to a palliative care doctor, is it they've exhausted a lot of these new procedures? Is it the, you know, the opioid side? Like, where would you suggest in that journey that kind of pain and palliative intersects? Again, I think that palliative care is pain management and it really belongs in the primary care setting. It goes hand in hand with managing chronic conditions. Um, I see patients every day in the um, spinal intervention world. That's what I do. I take care of patients' pain every day, and we do it successfully without opiates. There's yeah. certainly room for opiates. You know, somebody has surgery or they got malignancies or they're in acute um, yeah. situation, but you know, the, so much has gone into new guidelines and new data and new research and 
every, almost every federal agency under the US Department of Health and Human Services has contributed to new information about why we don't need to use opiates. And what's interesting for me is to have watched the whole pendulum shift, you know, from being aggressive with opiates. I, I did a, um, I was a pain fellow at um, Memorial, or May Day pain fellow at Sloan Kettering, but to, you know, to see aggressive use of opiates, why aren't we using them to now, why are we using them? Yep. Um, and the data suggests that, you know, other medications, which we call adjuvant medications, actually work just as well, if not better than opiates. So I always tell patients, if we look at inflammation, for an example, that's one of the biggest indicators of pain. I can throw all the opiates and muscle relaxers and central nervous system stimulating drugs at that all day. It's not gonna take care of it. The anti-inflammatories or the cortical steroids are the medicines that would take care of the inflammation. Somebody has nerve pain. No amount of opiate in and of itself is ever gonna take care of nerve pain. Yeah. There's other medications, you know, antidepressants, um, anti-convulsants that we can use that are indicated to manage uh, nerve pain. Um, and spinal in interventions work amazing. And I see all of those things as palliative. I see my job, even though I'm not taking care of people that are terminally ill and dying, but they have chronic pain, I see my job as a palliative provider uh, managing their pain from a spinal intervention perspective. Yeah, no, that makes a lot of sense. And so now that, you know, we've got we, the silver tsunami, we have a lot of uh, seniors aging, wanting to age at home with multiple, you know, chronic diseases and that management um, becomes a little more complex as you have specialty docs in the mix, as you have primary care, um, as you have all these kind of things going on. As we look at the future of where kind of palliative is headed, a lot are, are a lot of palliative and as well as hospice are really looking at, you know, extending that virtual care into the home and how to have better patient outcomes and not have the windshield time of the palliative care providers, you know, driving home to home, facility to facility, things of that nature. So now with remote patient monitoring, with telehealth, with things like that, where do you see if we roll the tape and, you know, we're talking in five years from now, where do you see the palliative care providers being able to extend and have, you know, changing condition, you know, on the hospice side or more proactive chronic care on the palliative side? Where do you see kind of that um, mix headed with kind of where we are with seniors, caregivers, and where that's all headed? Yeah, absolutely. Again, I see palliative care back in the primary care provider's uh, responsibility. I don't think symptom management necessarily needs to be isolated from primary care. And uh, as a patient traverses down the trajectory of disease, obviously they're going to get weaker and they're not going to be able to come into primary care um, clinic. But you know, in 2015, CMS developed the chronic care um, management incentive. So primary care providers who have patients that have more than two chronic diseases, they think they're going to die within a year, they're eligible for 24-7 uh, constant monitoring by their primary care provider, and they get incentivized to do that. I right. think, you know, what's unfortunate is most um, uh, primary care providers are not familiar with this model and they're not utilizing it. And you can use that from remote. You can text the patient, you can call the patient, you know, you can have tele, um, telehealth with that patient and still get reimbursed as well as get reimbursed with telehealth as well. I think, you know, the whole patient empowerment, um, shared decision-making, patient self-management, engaging patients to, in their care uh, to identify early on symptoms that could take them into hospital and communicating with their care team earlier than later will keep people at home, will keep them more physically active, will, you know, obviously influence their improved quality of life and, you know, help them to do the things that are important to them uh, before they're, you know, not able to get out of bed. Right. No, that's great. And, and so the last question, we talked about this earlier in the show, and I'd like to get your opinion as well. We talked a lot about exactly what you said, kind of the quality of life versus quantity of life. And a lot of times, you know, patients are used to listening to their provider, the white coat, respecting that. That's kind of the generation they came from is you do whatever the doctor says to do. But a lot of times there isn't those honest conversations as Dr. Tim was talking about earlier to say, you know, do you want to start chemo on Tuesday or Thursday? It's not 
you know, hey, if you, this is how you're going to feel through chemo and you could live, you know, five years or you could live X number of years with no, um, you know, quantity versus quality of life. Do you feel like that's changing and, and there's more honest conversations or everyone's kind of afraid to have those conversations or where are you on, on where you think that is today? Well, I think it's interesting with the onset of the Affordable Care Act, if we look at some of the agencies that were created out of that, the Patient-Centered Outcomes Research Institute or PCORI, uh, everything is patient-centered and patients are actually participating in the research designs and contributing to ideas about what should be funded. Um, the, all of the resources that have gone into what I just mentioned before, shared decision-making, uh, patient self-management, patients being engaged, looking at literacy levels, all of those things focusing specifically on the patient is a big shift in what we've seen in the past. And this whole macro legislation where providers have to actually quantify what it is that they're doing to determine whether or not they get uh, incentive reimbursement in their practice. So I think we're looking at changing that. I, you know, I'm having a conference, a national conference this fall, and we have half a day developed or designated to pain, and we're approaching it from it takes a village to take care of a pain patient, right? It takes a doctor, it takes a nurse, it takes a social worker, it takes a spiritual advisor, it takes a chiropractor. Sometimes it takes a, an attorney or a physical therapist. I mean, it takes a whole team of people to take care of one patient to make sure that they get where they're supposed to be. And if we look at the true meaning of palliative care, it is a team approach to making sure that that patient has everything that they need. No, I think that's great. And um, so the one thing we always ask at the end of the show is what is one thing healthcare related that is keeping you up at night? Well, the thing that I write about a lot is, um, you know, I think one of the biggest things and all of us that are in healthcare, I'm sure see it from time to time is anecdotal practice. You know, not implementing the best evidence, not staying current with the current guidelines, not making sure that the patients are getting the most current interventions or, you know, I see, you know, we don't recommend aspirin routinely anymore. We, you know, there's a big thing on vitamin D and fish oil and all these things that, you know, we have to stay on top of in order to make sure that the patients are getting the best care. Um, I was really surprised in 2016 when the CDC announced unintentional death as the third leading cause of death in the United States. The majority of it comes from opiate prescribing, but you know, we're responsible as healthcare providers to be making sure that we're using the best information to guide optimal patient care, particularly in the fragile patient population. Well, that's great. It has been so great having you on the show today. I want to thank both of our guests for being on the show today. We had great conversations on chronic disease management and palliative care. Please click on the link in the show notes to follow either of our guests today and ask any questions. As always, make sure you subscribe to the show to get it delivered to your player of choice on Tuesday and Thursday. Thank you so much again for being on the show. You were great today. Thank you. This podcast has come to a close. To hear more from the Executive Innovation Show podcast, subscribe, submit questions, and share the love. Follow us on social. We're everywhere.